Hey guys, and welcome to episode 206 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I interview Dr. Patricia Zarita Ono. Patricia is a psychologist and director of East Bay Behaviour Therapy Centre. And today I got her on to talk about her new book, The ACT Workbook for Teens of OCD. Now, I was honoured to be asked to write the foreword for this book, and the book is now live if you wanted to check it out. Um, so I wanted to get her on to talk about acceptance and commitment therapy, and how she uses that with uh, children and adolescents affected by OCD, and also how she brings it into her exposure and response prevention or ERP work she does with those kids and teens. So in this episode, we talk about what is ACT, um, how she uses it with children and teens, how she uses ACT with ERP together, how they enhance one another, uh, values-based exposures, this idea of the choice point, willingness in therapy. Uh, we talk about the new book specifically, uh, Living with Certainty, Words of Hope, and much, much more. Now, obviously, the episode is focused on children and teens. However, a lot of the questions are answered, uh, which with answers, I believe, applicable to all ages. So I think you'll find something in it. So thank you to Patricia, and thank you to you guys for listening. And without further ado, here she is. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Patricia Zarita Ona. Patricia is Director of the East Bay Behaviour Therapy Centre and Adjunct Professor at the Wright Institute. She is the author of several books, including Escaping the Emotional Roller Coaster and her new book, The ACT Workbook for Teens with OCD, Unhook Yourself and Live Life to the Full. Welcome to the show, Patricia. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to have you here. And... As you know, I like to get people's, if they have an OCD story, if not in the case of therapists, you know, what got you into being a, a therapist or psychologist and then what got you into treating OCD specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, so let me start by asking you, do you want the Latino version? Do you want the American version of my response? Whichever you feel <laughs> most comfortable with. Um. Well, when I was maybe, I think, 14, 15 years old, I was reading a lot of philosophy. And I was reading this book, Crime and Punishment. Mm. And I was very, very interested in all the layers that the characters were going through, the complexity and all the struggles. And that was actually, for me, one of the books that really, really captured all my interest in the complexity of all the different pools that we have, right? To behave in one way, to think in one way. And and also at that time, I was very curious about relationships, about connecting with people, getting to know people in a more intimate level. So I think it was very clear for me that I want to do something around that. And with time, that little by little shape into having this clarity about wanting to be a psychologist. Hmm. And then, so so you had this inspiration, and then how did your journey go into becoming a fully fledged psychologist? So, for my undergrad, I was looking for for. Um, for a program in psychology, and I went to one, um, but it was very. Um, it was very based in psychoanalysis. Actually, for two years, I was in a school that was giving this massive training in psychoanalysis. And I had to do analysis one hour a week uh, and pay 10 Bolivians. And I had this guy that never talked to me. He barely smiled. He barely said something, right? If I got that reaction, it was like, oh. Um, so for three years, I was super passionate about learning about psychology. I had only one instructor that was interested in behaviorists. Uh, and then I switched to do a school psychology. So I think the path was I went from philosophy into realizing I want to connect with people. And then I realized the psychology will give me that venue. But then I had to search a particular way of understanding reality and understanding human behavior that fit more with how I see the world and how I see people. That's also how I love into radical behavior is to that um, frustration I had when I was doing psychoanalysis for two years. Hmm. And then at what point did you decide you wanted to work with uh, OCD? That's a, that's a very interesting question. I think I was always very interested definitely in anxiety. Um, 
when I switch programs from doing psychoanalysis, I start doing more school psychology work. So I work with children, families, and teens. And I start working there with anxiety, academic performance, social anxiety, uh, kids with OCD. Later on also, naturally, I start having also my own struggles with own anxiety. I had my first panic attack in my early 20s. And I still remember that very, very clear. And I write and share about that. Uh, but I think the interest was really from long time ago. And little by little, I start morphing more into working with people that was really, really getting stuck. And I think with OCD, one of the things that has been really moving to me is that my clients really start doubting themselves, who they are, what, do they really want to do this or not? So I think the sense of disconnection of who they want to be and what the obsessions are driving for them, it's really painful when you're witnessing that. Hmm. So little by little, I started getting so much more passionate about working with all types of fear-based struggles, including OCD in particular. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. that that's interesting. And so your your new book is, it, it covers ERP as well, and we'll get into that. Um, but it is a large part based around ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, so how would you describe ACT to someone who, who isn't familiar with it? Mm-hmm. That's a really great question, Stu. I think that um, so much has been written about ACT, right? I will do... I will do my best to summarize it, right? Um, so your audience doesn't get lost. Um, I think um, if I have to describe ACT, I will say that it's a therapy that really helps you to, to figure out what's important to you, do what is important to do, uh, do what matters, and take with you all the yucky stuff that shows up under your skin, right? Um, so I think... Act beautifully blends behaviorists, radical behaviorists with mindfulness, but it does it in a way that really creates this this sense of direction when you're looking at your values. Um, I think for me as a therapist and as a person was extremely revitalizing when I discovered ACT. Um, But I think we have to do a much better job disseminating and just really maybe summarizing in a nutshell a little bit what it's about. So thank you for the question. Yeah, no worries. Uh, and m- many of my guests will be fully um, uh, understanding. What's the word? For their, well, they will understand ERP uh, very well if they listen to this show a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's primarily all we talk about, uh, occasionally ACT uh, and some other stuff. Um, but so, so yeah, so, so they would get how, how to do exposures and the response prevention therapy part. Um, but with ACT, how do you bring in ACT when working with children or teens, in, with, with OCD specifically, I should say? I really love your questions. They, get, they, they, yeah. they put me thinking a lot. I appreciate that. Um, so I think my take is that ACT is already an exposure-based therapy mm-hmm. because in ACT, it's all about helping you really to get in contact with, with all those uncomfortable experiences, whether it's driven by thoughts, feelings, and sensations that are driving problematic behavior, right? Um, however, ACT also does a specific targeted exposures, and that's what ERP blends beautifully. Um, so if you think about the six processes of ACT, um, for people who are not familiar, right, the six processes are values, committed action, diffusion, acceptance, self as a context, and contact with the present moment. Um, I won't go in details about each one of them, but if you think about ERP, it lands beautifully with a whole model of ACT, but in particular with the acceptance-based processes and the diffusion, right? Because this is about really leaning, approaching, sitting with old and comfortable experience and detaching, stepping back and watching the thoughts for what they are. Um, so I think ERP really correlates or matches with these two processes in particular. Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Mm. Um, the other way will be that um, when we're thinking about response prevention, decreasing the compulsions, decreasing the avoidance, 
act also lands beautifully with the values and with a committed action, right? In terms of even though you may have these urges about doing some touching, some rubbing, on trying to mentally figure out what's going on, right? You really check in this moment what's truly important to me, what really matters. And if I do that compulsion, is that I move towards or away from my values? Um, so I think if I have to blend a little bit or, or yeah, summarize how ACT and ERP blend, that's one way of conceptualizing and thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, good point. And someone on the show said before that ACT and ERP are kind of um, two sides of the same coin, um, which I quite mm-hmm. liked. They, As you've just said, they are somewhat very similar. They're just approaching things slightly different um yeah 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 i think i love that 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 reference right one of the things that i found in that work i think doing erp it's it's really hard work Mm. hard work for my clients and hard work for us as as therapists also many times right Uh, because everyone is getting out of the comfort zone many times um, what i found that it's beautifully that i didn't have before learning act is that makes a huge difference to asking people what will make it worth it for you to get in touch with that yucky stuff. Mm. I think that question builds so much more willingness uh, and really anchors everything into the values, how people want to show up to themselves and to others. So I think in that way, that's really, really unique of how you can add or augment ERP with ACT processes before the exposure, during the exposure, and after the exposure. Mm. Okay, and and you mentioned the the choice point. I don't know if you used the word choice point, but you definitely talked about it. Um, yeah, it'd be good to kind of explain what the choice point is and why it's useful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things, if it's okay, um, allow me to share briefly a story. Yeah, how perfect. everything started. Um, a couple of years ago, in my practice, we ran this intensive treatment for children, teens, and adults. The youngest client we had, we had maybe was six years old with, um, with fears of contamination, couldn't hug the parents. Um, so we have, you know, I think a broad range of experiences working with OCD and different types of um, ages. So there's one time when a teenager comes to my office and the teenager is completely fed up and brutally upset, right? Because of course the parents know this OCD, the teen agrees it's OCD, and they went to two different therapies trying to do ERP, and, um, but the challenge, like the teen really didn't want to do it because he feel that everyone was forcing him. Um, and I still remember that because um, the family was definitely in very, you know, beautiful family and the team was so much fun and very alive, but hated this idea about doing exposures, right? Mm. Um, and I think one of the things that this, this thing was really, really upset is that he didn't have too much a say in the treatment. Um, and it's not, no one was imposing anything. It's about that the framing maybe was different, right? It was coming from the parties and from the therapist. And to me, to be honest, that was one of those sessions in which I was very clear that we know that ERP is the frontline treatment and it works and we have beautiful data showing that and it has helped hundreds of people. And yet we have to do better because we still have, you know, some people that just doesn't respond or they don't like it or doesn't land well on them. Um, so with time over the years, I was thinking about how we can try act, um, in different ways. And that's when I ended up, um, with a choice point. Um, so I think that choice point, it's, it's a graphic, basically. We're going to help people to map what's the triggering situation, what are the obsessions that pop up. And then we really capitalize that they basically have two choices. One is doing moves away or when they are getting hooked on the obsessions. And that will be all the avoidance responses, all the compulsions. And then on the other side of the graphic, you have all the moves towards your values. More doing exposure exercises, values-based exposures, practicing acceptance, leaning in where I'm scared of. What I think has been really 
beautiful of building the choice point in the work is that it really capitalizes where the kids are. Teenagers mm. don't like to be told what to do, what to see, what to wear, right? <laughs> they're yeah. rebellious by nature. And they're supposed to be doing that. So this idea that they can choose what to face, when to face it, for how long face it, what they are scared of, makes the treatment so much more accessible for them, right? Mm. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I could add about the choice point is that while um, it's a graphic, it really is just a prompt or a cue for people to remember that when you are getting triggered, when there is this yucky stuff showing up, you can choose, right? I think this is something that teenagers have by nature, but because the obsessions can be so loud or the avoidant behaviors have been overgeneralized, they forget that they have this natural capacity to step back and watch how they want to respond. So the choice point captures and remind the teens that they can do it, that they're actually strong, hmm. that they face OCD. Yeah. So do you find that over time through through talking about the choice point and, and using it with uh, ERP and that they, they learn over time that when obsessions come up or, or intrusive thoughts, instead of instantly reacting to them and doing a compulsion, they can kind of catch it and then think, hey, mate, I have a choice here, to, as you said, to move towards what I want or away from it, which is doing a compulsion. That has been my experience. That has been my experience. Um, I, I think what I have found also that presenting the choice points from the beginning of the treatment during every single exposure session, right? Like that's what I do when, when mm -hmm. after we develop a values-based exposure menu, the teens come to the exposure sessions, I hand in their exposure menu, they choose what they're going to face, and then we organize our exposure session using the choice point, and then we do our debriefing. Um, so that the feedback I get from them a lot is that this idea that they are in charge, they are not being forced, they are the ones who are choosing again for how long they are going to do these exposures, when they are going to do it, how they are going to do it, they also know that our work is about getting out of the comfort zone, right? So, so sometimes we go back and forth negotiating, right? Uh, but the frame is that they are the ones that are choosing how to face things. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, and something I always find people get stuck on, including myself from time to time, with uh, the uh, acceptance part of ACT, because um, especially with OCD, the, the thoughts can be so troubling that I think when people hear the word acceptance, they think they have to accept that the thoughts, uh, well, it's how I've had people message me before that, do I need to accept that the thoughts are true? Uh, and, and my belief is no, you don't. It's you're accepting the possibility as kind of, is that, yeah, how would you kind of answer that, I guess? That's a great question, right? Um, I think I can tell you my take on that. I'm sure different act therapists are going to have different frames to do it. Mm. One of the things that one of the things that I have found um, is that after I do an intake and I learn, you know, I, I learn how the OCD is affecting a person's life and if there is social phobia or depression or trauma, right? And we come up with a treatment plan, which is ACT plus ERP. 99% of the time. Um, it's important, I think, that we create a frame for the world that we're going to be doing. One of the things that I found is that many of my clients, they have developed these, not developed, but they get hooked into these ruling thoughts mm -hmm. about how to handle fear, how to handle anxiety, how they need to know, right? So we talk a lot before doing any of the ERP about how the mind is a content generator. It's throwing up content constantly, and it's also creating thinking patterns, right? It's a content generator and a thinking pattern machine. And one of the things that the mind does is generate hundreds of rules, protective rules. I need to know for real. I need to do something about this right now. If I don't do that compulsion, it's still like I am causing it, causing it. Um, I don't like to be afraid. It makes me weak to have, it's weird to have these thoughts. 
So we create a frame by acknowledging and catching all these ruling thoughts and how they drive some behaviors for them. Um, I found that if we tell clients acceptance is just sitting in and leaning with it, I think they usually tell me that's a bunch of baloney, Dr. Z. It doesn't work like that, right? Um, I don't think it's because it doesn't work. I think it's the frame in which we're introducing processes makes a huge difference, right? So I think if you create a frame to acknowledge that the mind is creating all this noise that is trying to protect you, and while after building that, you go into values and then you build exposure menu, this idea of leaning with a discomfort or practicing acceptance, um, and we do a couple of experiential exercises to notice the difference in the body, right, when you're fighting versus when you're opening up, mm. Um and I do also some willingness exercises and then do exposure. I think it's a more it's a process in which people are learning by experience versus by being told that mm. acceptance is just leaning in or making room for, right? Because yeah. it sounds very abstract that if we just present like this. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Uh, and you mentioned willingness there, and I think that's an important word for people with OCD and I guess anyone going through uh this type of therapy but yeah if you could just describe the word willingness and, and why you would do stuff around that let me check wikipedia first I'm well i should say not the actual <laughs> definition of willingness I, hopefully people have a vague idea of what that is but yeah no that that's a great question um so i can give you the non-academic definition and how i see it again um if I have to answer your question, I will say that willingness is a personal choice that we make to experience something that we may not want to experience, right? It's not the powering through, it's not I'm going to beat this up, right? I think it's really choosing to be present with that uncomfortable, yucky stuff that is going to help me to make a move towards who I want to be and how I want to show up to the people I love. Mm. Uh, that's how I will present it, right? Um, I think what I would like to add, if it's okay, is that I also, I think within ACT, there is a lot of, you learn about these experiences by practicing, not too much by talking, right? So we do a couple of um, awareness exercises or willingness workouts sometimes in my in my practice, right? Um, I invite my clients. I usually ask them if there is a snack that they hate the most, right? Or you ask them if they like tofu, and most people hate tofu. Tofu is overrated, I think so. <laughs> so I ask them to imagine, although sometimes they bring these snacks and try it, right? And we check how it's when you're fighting, right? How much there is the frowning, the faces we're making versus when you are relaxing and just are making a decision to experience that discomfort, right? Mm. Uh, and you can do this willingness ex exercises with all types of things, right? Scenes of movie you don't like to watch, um, doing exercises you may not like, right? Wearing a piece of clothing you don't like and see the difference between powering through it and just doing it versus actually choosing to know this, okay, my heart is beating fast. Mm. My mind is telling me that this sucks, right? Um, so I think there is a lot to, to say about creating that process um, in preparation for facing what people are scared of. Yeah. Yeah, so when they go into... Uh, do the exposures and the ERP they're not kind of uh, white knuckling it so to speak they're they're going in it with they're scared but they're going in it with some willingness of I want to face this as opposed to I have to do it and maybe they're more closed off and reserved to doing it yeah yeah I think that is to me um I was originally trained in in, in heavy CBT right I was doing a lot of the C's and the B's right from a lot of the B um, but one of the things that is different with ACT, I think, is that you create a context for this process of change and you create it by having these micro experiences that people encounter and then we start facing um, what they are avoiding, right, and discontinue the compulsions. So I think on that sense, it's a little bit different than doing traditional ERP, right? In which you do an exposure hierarchy or exposure menu and you jump into the exposure and you, you do psychoid, of course. 
I think with ACT, and again, there are many ways of doing it. I'm just sharing the way I do it. It is extremely important for me to create the frame for, um, and I think you pay attention to, you know, the goals that people have, right? Do I want to get rid of my anxiety or I need to know, or, you know, is it going to work out, right? How, how will I know, right? So you're always thinking, am I on the acceptance side of things or am I on the value side of things, right? And that's how you organize the session. So I think that's very different. And, and when you create this process, when you start doing the values-based exposure exercises, you're checking, okay, are we powering through? Are we making room for it, right? But it's more a familiar process versus just jumping quickly into it. Yeah, good points. Um, so your new book, which is the ACT Workbook for Teens with OCD, mm. uh, and I believe some point next year you'll also have an adult version of that book. Um, yeah, just tell us about it. Well, thank you so much for asking about it. That's kind of you. Um, I think what I was trying to do again, it's, it's um, create resources for my clients that are, that are different and an alternative. We know the ERP is the online treatment. It just happens that we, meet, we may need to have so much more resources than what we have right now. Um, an act is a very flexible model, right? So every therapist is going to be doing differently. For me, I found that a choice point create really helped me a lot in my work and with my clients to create a frame for doing the work they are going to be doing. Um, it's it's reading in a team friendly language. It has illustrations. It's full of exercises. Um, Every chapter, basically, there are very short chapters, and the idea is that with every chapter, there's going to be a micro skill they're learning and add some ERP skills all together. And I was very fortunate that when working on it also, I ran it by a lot of my teenager clients, and they had some input to it. I have examples about over 15 types of decision exercises they can be doing, how to incorporate acceptance, some tips to reduce compulsions. So I think I am, I am excited about, um, about the book being out there. I think um, it's a workbook that really will help people to go into these micro processes in every single chapter. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, I agree. Um, and I believe when this episode comes out, uh, your book will have already been released. So it's currently on pre-order, but I think if you're listening to this right now, then you should be able to go buy it. Um, and when's the adult version going to be live? Thank you. The adult version, um, if it's okay to share a little of bit. Course, um, yeah. For the adult version, I am not using the choice point. In my clinical work, I primarily use the choice point with teens and with the children because I think lands where they are, right? Mm. Uh, but with adults, I think I found a different frame. I start mapping these ruling thoughts, and then we go into values-based exposures. Um, I have added, actually, a lot of self-compassion exercises, values-based problem solving, and also how to... Um, how to anticipate some of the potential obstacles about um, after you are done with ERP, right? Um, one of the things that I have found in my work with adults is that they do develop these stories about who they are as people. Am I a monster? I am broken. I am messed up. No one will ever marry me if I have OCD. And that has been brutal. And I think ERP doesn't tackle that, right? Because it's different. So what I have, that's why I added some extra skills, right? So the book for adults definitely has act and ERP uh, blended together from the beginning to the end. Uh, but the last section has maybe six, seven chapters in which I am really um, presenting different skills to how to handle these narratives that people may have developed because mm. of the OCD. Uh, and how to approach life when things go wrong, right? Um, and also how to know this when your brain is latching into something, which could be anything, and how it can that can develop into an OCV episode. Um, I think that book should be around, around March 2020, uh, March or April 2020. Nice. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. No, looking forward to it. Um, 
Okay, so very general question now, which is advice for living with uncertainty. Wow. Let me pause one second and think about it. Yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question. Hmm. I think, okay, let's see how we do with this response. So this, this is, um, here's what will be my advice that it's a natural thing that we want to know, right? Our brain is not wired to live with no knowing or to live in ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural process of, of course, we need to know for real, for sure, right now. My invitation is when we have those moments to check what happens in my life when I actually start doing that, when I go into that, I need to know right now. Does it help me to be the person I want to be? Does it help me to show up to the people I want in the way I want? Or does it take me away from that? So that was a long response. <laughs> yeah, that a good one. Is there something you notice your, your clients who seem to recover or make progress quicker than others? Is there something they're doing differently? Wow, that's a great question. That's a great question, Stu. Um, um, I don't have the data to back this up. Mm -hmm. I can tell you anecdotally what I have um, witnessed in my work. Um, and I think when my clients turn on the willingness um, dial for them, um, and they approach things where they are scared of, any of these fears, obsessions, images as a choice, I think you see a shift, um, but that that is what I have witnessed. I think it's the power in truth, right? Like I have to get rid, get rid of this anxiety. Let's do exposure right now. I think that creates a different experience during the exposure mm -hmm. and during the treatment as well. So I think it's this 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 openness that again is more an experience that people choose to have. I think facilitate facing what people are scared of. Yeah, yeah. And it naturally comes with, with the high levels of discomfort, right? Yeah. But I think anchoring that in the values and the des personal decision I'm making, I think creates a different mileage in the work that we do. Yeah, good point. And uh, yeah, just words of hope for those with OCD. I have many, I think if I have to choose a couple of words of hope, um, I, I will say that I know whatever you are, you're doing the best you can to handle those moments of stuckness. And I want to invite you to never give up and to know that change is possible. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then two very random questions now so let, let's say you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self uh, what would you tell her wow that was a random question <laughs> um yes although i hear and you should you ask this question let me think hmm. i think if i have to grab the phone and talk to my 20 year old self i would say Patricia, don't stop knocking on doors. Amazing things happen when you keep knocking on doors. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask what will you say if you have to call your 20 years <laughs> old man? Uh, what would I say? Um, okay, what was I doing when I was 20? Uh, probably just speak to someone. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. simple as that. Um, Maybe give more details about who to speak to, but generally just speak to someone. Um, yeah. Thank you yeah. for asking me. Um, and then uh, you've got a billboard. Uh, what do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? Wow. Um, that, and I'm writing something, anything? Yeah, anything. Hmm. So many hmms right now because I have to think. <laughs> um, 
I would say wow, what well, I would say anything I would say hmm. I think I would say it sound a little bit cheesy, right? Um, but I think I think that living doing what is truly important to us makes a huge, huge difference. And once you experience that, there is no coming back to the old ways. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know if that all will fit in a billboard, but that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Okay, is there is there anything else that you wish you could have shared today that I haven't asked you? Um, yes, there is one addition. I if it's um it, that I would like to make maybe yeah to the adult books. I think I didn't mention that one of the core concepts um, that I'm building that I created in the book is how to make the shift from reactive moves into wise moves. Mm. And because I think many times when people get triggered, like all of us, it's really easy to get hooked, right? Uh, but the wise moves actually are prompts and cues for different act processes that help you to stay with the experience instead of going to a reactive behavior. Um, in my work with my clients, I got a lot this question how do I supposed to handle this moment on trigger? How do I keep moving forward in the conversation? How do I show up to my date, right? Um, and I think if I think about act processes, right, there's micro, um, micro decisions that people have to make by noticing how your body's reacting, labeling the obsessions. Here comes Mr. Dictator talking to me, right? Here comes sassy, sassy Patricia. <laughs> what's truly important for me um, I found that has been really helpful in the world with clients that they can have something very concrete that can use as a prompt for how to um, choose these these act ERP processes when they are getting triggered in a situation hmm. yeah I like that and that's all in the adult book yes that's in the adult book yes cool all right fantastic well, look, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's great to finally get you on and talk about this stuff. And, you know, hopefully people go out and check your books. I just want to say, Stu, uh, first, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Over the years, I think I have admired and get inspired by all what you're doing in creating new resources for people, a message of hope, and also really the integrity you have, trying to disseminate, you know, ERP that works. Um, so thank you so much, actually, for all the work you do. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the episode and links to the book and all other resources will be at theocdstories.com. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care. Thank you.